football, the game of pressure. Many have played the game, but only a few played the game, but only a few have performed best when the clock and all odds were stacked against them. These men played their finest when it counted most, in the crunch. Anybody can play when there's really nothing at stake, uh, regardless of the game, regardless of the situation. But I really think the, the measure of the player is how well he plays under pressure when you have to win. Takes the snap and drops to the goal line. He sacked in the end zone, folks. Holland Jones right up the middle. Safety. Hand off to Allen. Follows a block off the right side of the 18, to the 15, to the 10. He breaks a tackle at the 5. He drives to the end zone. Touchdown, Raiders. A magnificent 28 yards of determination. The few who have excelled in the crunch. No one ever played better when it counted most than Baltimore Colt quarterback John Unitas. If ever there was a man who could stop a clock, it was John Unitas. There was no quarterback in the history of the game who could ever do more with two minutes on the clock. I went back and researched the number of plays that he could get off within two minutes. There were times when it was 12 plays. There were times when it was 14. There are occasions when there were as many as 17 plays that he ran in a two-minute span. He just knew how to get rid of the ball, how to throw it out of bounds, how to stop the clock, how to use these timeouts judiciously, and to get everything out of a football offense that was there to get. It often seemed that in every game John Unitas appeared, something dramatic and exciting happened. I didn't mind pressure. I guess these people talk about pressure, but you know, it's there are situations, but there's a pressure situation. Pressure is no big deal. It's a situation and how you're gonna work the situation out. If you've been put in the situations during practices that week, then you know how to react to them. Two plays. First play, split right, 40 series right, second play, be a split right, pull back, draw, both of them on run. Ready? Getting in those situations, especially when you know that you have to get down the field quickly with your two-minute offense, was fun to me because you enjoy putting people in situations and then making a fool out of them if you possibly can. Poise under pressure gave Unitas a power of leadership that words alone could not have done. And his stunningly accurate arm allowed him to do what the magic quarterbacks have always done. Race the clock and bring his team from behind. just had something that the uh, top quarterbacks have, ice water in his veins. It really spooked the defense. They, they thought he was, they thought he was Houdini. Number 19's greatest escape came in the 1958 NFL Championship before the disbelieving eyes of over 50 million. Trailing by three points with 90 seconds remaining, Unitas drove the Colts from their own 14-yard line. 
Four straight completions to Ray Berry, number 82, swept the Colts to a field goal that tied the game, sending it into pro football's first sudden death overtime. John took charge and said, we're going to take the ball and we're going to go right down and, and score this time. No question about it. And you could just feel the confidence ebb in, in, in the team. You know, we were tired. We had been out there longer than we ever dreamt that we'd be out there. And uh, we just felt that we could go down. The sequence of his play selection on this final 80-yard march was examined, studied, and written about for years afterwards. I didn't think they were going to stop us. Once we got past the 50-yard the line, the, I figured it, you know, we could move the ball just about any way we wanted to. This cold-blooded confidence kept the Colts on course with history. Up over the ball, come the ball, Mark Colts. Unitas calling out the signal. Unitas gives to Amici. The In 1958, only his third year in the NFL, John Unitas proved that pressure would never affect his performance. And from this time on, number 19 would become the standard by which all others would be measured in the crunch. Are we going to go down to the wire, or are we going to go down to the wire? Yeah, why not? Done it all year. It is coming down to the final nail-biting seconds. Time to get nervous. Cardiac kids are at it again. Get in to set this block up and then work your way right on into that rush. In 1979 and 1980, the Cleveland Browns prepared for each game in much the same manner as the teams they were about to play. Once they're getting there, we're looking at However, the results they achieved with the game on the line in the final seconds were something that nobody could have prepared for. We can win it. It's going to be a dogfight, and we know that it literally can come down the very last play of the game, and regardless of what happens, just hang in there together. 52 seconds to play. And the cardiac kids are at work today. Sight back to throw. He throws it in the end zone. It is a touchdown! Touchdown! Cleveland with 52 seconds left. Great call! What a great call! What a great call! Another cardiac finish. Particularly at the end of the game, if you give me four downs to throw, and those we can throw on fourth down. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to complete one of those and make a first down. So, particularly at the end of the game like that, I'm going to be throwing all the time. We're in sudden death. Back to throw. Side looks and throws it deep to Rucker. He's open. Touchdown! It's over! Reggie Rucker! Pass from sight. He wins the ball game. I don't think that Browns team ever panicked. So many games came down to the last two minutes, and we were extremely confident. We were almost uh, cocky in terms of what we felt like we could do. And it was a combination of excellent play at quarterback with Brian Seip and a number of receivers who just enjoyed being in situations like that. During two dazzling seasons, the Browns won 14 games in the final two minutes or in overtime. Cleveland constantly stretched their abilities and the sense of humor of their head coach to the limits. You have two timeouts in overtime. There's no care over. You have two Pittsburgh heads, too. Do we get anything to eat? We don't get nothing to eat. Each week, Sam Rotigliano reviewed game films that had more improbable twists and turns than a Hollywood movie. What we do best is throwing a football. And beside anything else that you would do would be increasingly boring. In 1980, the Cleveland Browns were a lot of things, but boring was never one of them. This team was exciting even when they lost. Browns lead by one point. Kramer to throw. There goes the alley-oop. Deflected. It's caught for a touchdown! The Browns left for 59 minutes and 59 seconds and lose the game. However, the Browns won more games than they lost at the wire. Come on, baby, one time, one time, one time, baby, one time, one time. Clock down to 34 seconds. Oh, uh, it's time to get nervous. Sipe, third and 20, throwing to Logan. He got it on the 20, 10, 5, touchdown, Dave Logan! I don't believe it. 
Cleveland. Touchdown. Cleveland's ability to beat the clock earned them 11 victories, and appropriately, they won the AFC Central Division Championship on the last play of the last game of the regular season. Two seconds, one second is over. This emotional roller coaster lifted the Browns into the AFC playoffs, where they would host the Oakland Raiders. On a Sunday better suited for Penguins, late in the fourth quarter, the Browns desperately needed one more miracle. I can remember in the huddle of the final drive of the Raider game, it was virtually the same as it had been the entire year. We knew we were going to win. I mean, we. There was no doubt in anybody's mind that we were going to go down and score. Starting on their own 14-yard line, the Browns raced the clock, battled the Raiders, and fought off the freezing elements in one last gallant attempt to rescue victory. Cleveland rolled to the Raider 13-yard line. But though they needed only a field goal to win, the Browns elected to roll the dice one final time. Red slot right. Slot right. Go right. No. The red slot right Man. affects the 88. Let's go. The ball on the 13-yard line of the Raiders, who lead 14 to 12. But with Cleveland needing only a field goal, the Browns appear to be in the driver's seat. An electrifying season had come to a shocking end. In the years to follow, the comeback magic that once made the Cleveland Browns one of pro football's best in the crunch never returned. If you look at what happened in 1980, uh, without question, we lived in the crunch. As it turned out, uh, we, we died in the crunch. No NFL player has ever demonstrated more courage in the crunch than Roger Staubach of the Dallas Cowboys. I think the biggest thing about Roger was the fact that he never quit. It didn't matter how much the Cowboys were down. I remember in, in uh, San Francisco, they were ahead of us 14 or 15 points, and it was three minutes to go or something. And, and I'll never forget, Roger pulled the game out because we beat him. And uh, that was the greatest comeback I'd ever seen, but he did it over and over and over throughout the year. Staubach rallied the Cowboys with 17 fourth quarter points, delivering the game winner with but 52 seconds to play. Staubach's competitive spark ignited a team that was renowned for its unemotional and cold demeanor. And it seemed that he was forever dragging the Cowboys from the brink of disaster. The greatest thing about Roger Staubach was he was a tremendous competitor. I don't care what you were doing, whether you were just taking a 40-yard sprint or you were playing one-on-one -on -one basketball, he's not going to let you beat him. I don't care what the stakes are, whether it's just for fun, that's what made him great. Number 12 could be stirred, but not shaken. And he was the target of every defense the Cowboys faced. When you're knocked down, you either can lay there and, and not do anything about it, or you get up and do something about it. And I used to like to bounce back also. I mean, I used to like to sometimes be down and have people stepping on me a little bit so I could, you know, kind of kind of recoil and come back. This fighting spirit turned teammates into crunch time believers. I believed that Roger was going to win every game that we played in. No matter how much time was left in the ball game, I always believed that Roger could win the game. Staubach was never bothered by the pressure of knowing that Dallas depended upon him more than any other player. 
and in his final regular season game against the Redskins, he showed exactly what it means to perform in the crunch. On two different occasions, Dallas trailed Washington by as many as 17 points. Still, Staubach kept the Cowboys coming back. One got the sense that Staubach had nerves of steel, or no nerves at all, as he bravely battled the pain, the clock, and the scoreboard that read Redskins 34, Cowboys 21. Clock is running, 238 left in the game. Can they come back again? Shotgun formation, Staubach looking into the face of a four-man rush, throwing, cut, spring, go. Touchdown. Touchdown. You gotta love the Cowboys. They're the most exciting team in the NFL. They can pull it out. 42 seconds left in the game. Redskins lead by six. How can you live like this doing this every oh, week? This is what it's all about. This is a killer from the eight yard line. Staubach throwing in the end zone. Tony Hill, touchdown, Tony Hill. The Cowboys have come from behind twice, unbelievably. Roger Staubach will always be remembered for the many times that he was able to deliver when there was something important at stake. Twice, Staubach helped the Dallas Cowboys to world championships. But in the harsh glare of pro football's biggest spectacle, the Super Bowl, no quarterback has ever matched Pittsburgh's Terry Bradshaw. I can say that the tougher the game, the more relaxed and confident I was in big games. The bigger the game, the better. But the real secret to me was that it is only a game. You've got NFL films every corner of the end zone. You've got 100,000 people. You've got hours of preparation. you got all these things going for you. You're playing in the biggest game in the world. And when it all boils down to, it's just a game. And once I was able to just to separate all the other things and say, hey, we're just going to block and tackle and throw football around and try to score points, and it's just a game. Don't make it any more than that. It's just a game. And always play your game. Don't let the situation dictate to you. You dictate to it. Terry Bradshaw played in four Super Bowls, and his Steelers won them all. Twice, he was the game's MVP. When you go to the Super Bowl the first time, you have 27 other teams trying to knock you off. And to go back again is saying something, but to go back four times is really saying something. And, and you have to take your hat off. I, I don't think there will be another quarterback able to do that again. The pressure of big games only seemed to stimulate Terry Bradshaw. Bradshaw's powerful right arm projected Pittsburgh to dizzying heights. And in tight situations, he never seemed to lose his grip on the game or the football. I held it differently, I guess, than, than most. As you can see, I have my finger on the tip of the football. And I had a wide hand, and I felt like I could control the football from tip to tip. I just naturally went to the top of the football, and I threw the javelin in high school and you gripped it like this but when the ball releases and you snap it then that's the last finger that leaves the football anyway and I always felt like it was like this finger was like a whip. Bradshaw's arm was the stuff of legends and his strength and mobility made him doubly dangerous to defense. He was also tough. During his 13-year career, Bradshaw absorbed his share of punishment. And on more than one occasion, it seemed as though last rites were in order. But in spite of pain, number 12 possessed a unique ability to rise above discomfort and return to play at top efficiency. I 
hurt real bad when I was down, and it was embarrassing to come back. <laughs> it really was. And the players were really getting on to me. And I had this bad thing, you know, I just didn't lay down. I flopped like a fish, you know. I, the pain hurt me a lot, and I'd just squirm and wiggle, and they'd tie me down. In St. Louis, they'd have the ambulance come out and put me on a stretcher and strap me in. I'm going, Ralph, really, I don't think this is necessary. That's right, all right, get him on in the locker room. Hey, I'm going in the locker room. The people are clapping. Yeah, bless his heart, he's finished, but the players are taking their helmet off. You know, I mean, this is it. This is it, and I'm going in. And the whole time I'm going in, I'm saying, Ralph, I really can't believe we're doing this. <laughs> we used to give Terry, uh, uh, continuously, we'd give him Oscar awards for his performances. You've seen him carried off the field at halftime, and he jogs back on and throws 18 touchdown passes in the second half. No one ever pursued victory any harder than Terry Bradshaw. However, late in his career, Bradshaw's rough-and-tumble style finally caught up with him. He missed most of 1983 with an elbow injury he couldn't laugh off. But when the Steelers needed only one victory to earn a playoff spot late in the season, number 12 answered the call. So much had been made about me coming back that I had to play. You know, I knew I was not going to finish the game. There was no question. I knew this was it. I mean, something bad was going to happen to my elbow. But I said, you know, it's going to be so neat to go in there and play and win this game and get in the playoffs and do it after a year off. Nobody thinks it can be done. Bradshaw ignited a Steeler victory, tossing two touchdown passes before his weary arm finally gave out. His last pass went for a touchdown, while his courage inspired the Steelers into the playoffs, a fitting end for a player who always seemed to raise his level of performance when the pressure was the greatest and the game meant the most. Bobby Lane, number 22, was one of pro football's most colorful characters and a fiery quarterback who helped to make the Detroit Lions champions during the 1950s. Yet, he often appeared to do nothing right except win. Bobby was not the best passer. He was not the best faker, but he just hated to lose. He just doesn't like to, to lose. He wants to win in whatever he does. He instilled that into everybody else that no matter how far we got behind, that we could win. In 1956, the Lions trailed the Colts by 18 points before Lane rallied them with three touchdowns in the game's final two minutes. He delivered the game winner to hop along Cassidy as the final gun sounded. Bobby always said he never lost a ball game. The clock just ran out on him. <laughs> But if you give it enough time, he's going to come back and beat you. Trailing Cleveland 16-10 in the 1953 NFL Championship, Lane only had four minutes to drive Detroit the length of the field. With only seconds remaining, Lane hit Jim Duran with a 33-yard touchdown pass that secured the first of two NFL titles the Lions won under the irrepressible Bobby Lane. We were exciting. We, we uh, won so many games in the last two minutes, and uh, the fans got used to that. For Bobby, life was all fast lane, driven by an affection for bar rooms, cigarettes, and good times. Still, in the clutch, few have ever equaled this fierce competitor who could roll out of a pocket or into a saloon with equal ease. While Bobby Lane didn't miss much in life, neither did Kenny Stabler. The NFL's left-handed incarnation of Bobby Lane, this quarterback loved wine, women, song, and winning, though not necessarily in that order. Nicknamed the Snake, this Alabama country boy built an exciting 15-year career out of winning football games in unusual ways and maintaining a calming sense of humor. 
I'm facing the field and Stabler's facing me and he's listening. He has his, his, his helmet cocked up over his head. He's kind of looking around and he says, you know what, John? And I thought he had a play. I go, no, what, 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 what? Yeah, what, what, yeah, what, what are we gonna do? Go. And he goes, he goes, boy, he says, these fans are getting their money's worth today, aren't they? Stabler's ability to keep his team loose helped make the Raiders exciting, but his will to win made them champions. In order to do things late, late in football games with a lot of pressure and a lot of money on the table, uh, in order to get things done in that situation, it has to be that um, uh, uh, refusing to lose, you have to find a way, no matter what the circumstances are, or what the odds are against you and how much adversity you've gone through, you have to, somewhere along the line, find a way and just refuse to lose. Oakland trails 20 to 14. 10 seconds left. Stabler back. Here comes the rush. He sidesteps. Can he throw? He can. The ball flip forward as low as a wild scramble. Two seconds on the clock. Casper grabbing the ball. It is all a fumble. Casper has recovered in the end zone. The Oakland Raiders have scored on the most zany, impossible dream of a play. I got run to keep from hiding. I'm Rider. Stabler was one of the game's most accurate passes ever, and his leadership made him bullish in tight situations. It was like uh, when E.F. Hunton talks, everybody's going to listen. In the last three minutes, he would come into the huddle and he said, listen, we're not out of this thing by any means. And when he'd ask for that extra second, you know he was reaching deep down for that something that makes great those great ones, and he was reaching for that extra. There he is, fading, looking, looking, looking. He's under the gun. Slide, he throws. It is. The thing that I remember most about Stabler in combat was command presence. There was something about him walking into the huddle that put three more inches in everybody else's legs. Everybody got taller. Okay, in the huddle today, we got the snake at quarterback, the kid from Alabama. East full right, east full right. 99 in, two swing on one. He never believed that he was out of a game. I remember we were playing in New Orleans. First play after the intermission, we come out, he threw a pass, and they intercepted and scored a touchdown. They knock him out on the play. Stabler gets up off the ground. We go to the sideline. He says, I dug this hole. Now I'm going to climb out of it. And 42 points later, we had beat him, 42-35. Stabler subscribed to the belief that it's not how you start the game, it's how you finish. Yet I can remember one game we were at halftime, and he was something like 2 for 14 at halftime. And he stood up and said, hey, guys, I'm really lousy today, but we'll win. Let's go. And, and, and everybody said, yeah, and, and we won. Number 12 was the pride and poise of the Oakland Raiders during the 1970s. He was also a peerless passer who didn't always deliver the ball to where the playbook called for, but nearly always to where his receiver was open. In 1976, Stabler led the NFL in passing and the Raiders to Super Bowl XI, where his accurate left arm riddled the Minnesota Vikings. It was the crowning glory in a 15-year career that had more highs and lows than a country music song. But while others have won more championships, Ken the Snake Stabler will always be remembered for his determination. And as one of pro football's most colorful and unique characters in the crunch. When a game comes down to one big play, 
few have ever demonstrated more last-second leadership than Joe Montana of the San Francisco 49ers. Since his collegiate days at Notre Dame, Montana has demonstrated the unique gift for winning when all of the odds were stacked against him. This fact was vividly demonstrated in a frigid 1979 Cotton Bowl game against the Houston Cougars. When we came in from halftime, uh, I just got the chills and couldn't stop shaking. And so they didn't let me go back out. My temperature was, I think, 96 at the time. I had him in blankets and he was just shivering. You know, you could see him shivering and shaking. And, uh, you know, no one, no one thought he was going to be back out. Rechecked his temperature occasionally. It was coming up gradually. But the other problem was that as he was doing all this, we were hearing crowd noise. And as much as that was a home crowd, we knew that wasn't for us. The man who literally had ice water in his veins returned to lead Notre Dame back from a 34 to 12 deficit midway through the fourth period. In one of the most fabled comebacks in college football history, the Irish won 35 to 34 when Montana completed the game winner with no time on the clock. It was the stuff of legends. Yet later in 1979, NFL scouts were seemingly unimpressed as Joe Montana wasn't drafted until the third round by the 49ers. Tight. Z motion left, T78, X hook, on two. Ready? In his second season, Montana established himself as the starting quarterback. Then in 1981, he led the league in passing and the 49ers to the best record in football. In the NFC Championship game, Montana came face to face with America's team. The Dallas Cowboys took a 27 to 21 lead with less than five minutes to play. For Joe Montana and the 49ers, victory was 88 yards away with the doomsday defense sandwiched in between. With time slipping away, Montana steadily moved the 49ers downfield by running the ball when the Cowboys were expecting the pass. While the running game produced much of the yardage, three times Montana salvaged third downs with timely pass completions. The NFC Championship and the Super Bowl berth were at stake as this determined drive rolled up on the Cowboys' six-yard line. Right, we're going to call a bin pass halfback fan, a corner. He's going to break up and break into the corner. Okay. You got it? If you don't get what you want, you'll just throw it, simply throw the ball away. Okay. You know what I mean? Hold yeah. it, hold it, hold it. Not there. The way it goes. Everything hangs in the balance now. The season, the outcome of the Super Bowl berth hangs in the balance. He has the ball. Montana rolling out the right, looking toward the end zone, throwing under pressure, throws his pass. Caught by Clark. Clark got a touchdown. Clark, Clark has it. It's a touchdown for the 49ers. With one daring pass by Joe Montana and a brilliant reception by Dwight Clark, the 49ers completed an improbable 88-yard journey. San Francisco was ushered onto a world championship thanks to the comeback kid from Notre Dame. However, if fate had followed form, Montana's heroics might have been quickly forgotten. Cowboy wide receiver Drew Pearson had a history of saving games with clutch catches. And with only 40 seconds remaining, number 88 was only an arm's length away from turning Montana's headline into a footnote. It was one of the few times Pearson was unable to rescue the Cowboys. His 10-year career was a shining example of how one can overcome the odds and seize control of destiny. In 1973, this free agent out of Tulsa earned a spot on the Dallas roster with precise routes and sure hands. During the next decade, he dared to dream, then make his dreams come true. 
Now, I don't think uh, you can ever perform in those situations unless you dream of yourself being in those situations. As you're a kid, you always dream of yourself catching the winning touchdown. Uh, before a game, I would always envision myself making the big play, pulling the game out, winning the game, and fortunately, it happened quite a few times for me. In 1974, a 50-yard bomb from Clint Longley with 28 seconds left on Thanksgiving Day beat the Redskins. And in 1981, two Pearson touchdowns from Danny White in the final six minutes beat the Atlanta Falcons in the playoffs. This Doug Henning and Cleats had the unique ability to disappear in a secondary, then magically reappear with the winning score. His greatest illusion occurred in a 1975 playoff game against Minnesota with 32 seconds and 50 yards to go. Well, the Cowboys need a miracle. Roger takes the snap, pumps it once. Dallas was down to its last Hail Mary. He's going long down the near sideline for Drew Pearson. Pearson makes the catch at the five, touchdown! Scobach hit Pearson on a 50-yard touchdown. What you believe it? With a big game on the line, Drew Pearson was one of pro football's best clutch receivers. Pittsburgh's Lynn Swan was another. When I look at the championship game, a game that's really do or die, a playoff game, I want to do my best because this is the moment. And wherever there are great risks, there are great rewards, and you've got to take them. Number 88 was a special kind of performer, a showstopper who popped out of the chorus midway through the final act and belted out the big number. I always thought that what Swan did was a higher art form than what Baryshnikov has done. I know that Swan is not as good a dancer as Baryshnikov, but I would like to see Brezhnikov dance while people are trying to separate his head from his body. And I would like to see Brezhnikov catch a bullet pass while doing that stuff. Swan was the life preserver Terry Bradshaw grabbed for whenever the Steelers were sinking in the fourth quarter. Phenomenal leaping ability, uncanny uh, uh, ability to make impossible catches. His play in Super Bowl X, where he's out of bounds, catches the ball, and it seems like he has somebody up there pushing him back in bounds and then touches down. And then the one-handed grab and then fall and catch it while the guy's all over me. You just don't see people make those kinds of catches. I look back on that now that we're both out of the game, and you know, he really did make me look good a lot of times. <laughs> When it was down to one big play in Pittsburgh's big games, Lynn Swan always seemed to make the catch in the crunch. In 1967, the NFL championship was decided on one improbable drive across the frozen tundra of Green Bay's Lambeau Field. With four minutes, 40 seconds remaining, the Dallas Cowboys needed to stop the Green Bay Packers, who looked across a 68-yard polar ice cap and saw an opportunity for greatness. When we came on the field as a team to start that drive, and this is most important, uh, everybody in that huddle had the look that we were going to get it done somehow, some way. I felt that way, and it was the greatest feeling in the world. Battling 15 below zero temperatures and a brutal wind chill, Starr and the Packers began a storied quest in search of another NFL title. One of the biggest contributions came from a reserve fullback named Chuck Mercine. Number 30 rose out of obscurity to take his place in history by powering the Packers to a first and goal. However, when two straight plunges failed, 
Green Bay was forced to call their last timeout with 16 seconds left. The problem was that at that end, the south end of the field, uh, a shadow is cast down there late in the season by the school board, and the field was really frozen. And so the backs could not stand up and even get to the line of scrimmage. So when I went to the sideline, I told Coach Lombardi the wedge play would work. I said, but the backs can't get there. I said, I'm upright. I can just feel my way in for a couple of steps and then just lunge in there. He said, great, run it. Let's get this thing over with. Here are the Packers. Third down, inches to go. To Bader, 17 to 14. Cowboys out in front. Packers trying for the go-ahead score. Starr begins the count. Takes the snap. It was one small step for Bart Starr, one giant leap for the Green Bay Packers, who won their third straight NFL championship. Many still regard this drive as the greatest of all time. But two decades later in Cleveland, history would record an equally improbable ending to another championship epic. And the Broncos are 98 yards away from where they need to go. Still five minutes to go, but they need something out of this drive. Trailing 20 to 13 with five minutes and 44 seconds remaining in the 1986 AFC Championship, quarterback John Elway headed the Denver Broncos into a five degree wind chill and threw the 98 hazardous yards that stood between them and greatness. I never thought that anyone in the huddle doubted that we could do it. We walked in knowing that it was a do or die situation and that uh, uh, there was nothing else. It uh, either go to the Super Bowl, we're going home, and we got a chance to do it on this drive, and it was just a matter of getting out of the where we got some breathing room. Lots right. of right, Johnson left, Elway in the end zone, and throwing it, it's complete. Winder dives out to the seven yard line. the 26-yard line as the first down. Three minutes to go. Elway to pass on first down. The pass for Sewell. Got it and keeps it at the 48-yard line. Denver flew across midfield with two minutes remaining, and the anxious moments only added to the drama. Come on, guys. Come on. Stick it to him, baby. Elway running up in the pocket. is coming and caught. Mark Jackson, first down at the Cleveland 27-yard line. Elway was running in the footsteps of Unitas, Starr, and Montana as he ran, passed, and coaxed the Broncos to the Cleveland 5-yard line. 42 seconds to go. Broncos at the Cleveland 5. Third down and a yard. The snap to Elway. The look, the throw, touchdown to Mark Jackson, 98 and a half yard drive. Elway beat the odds, the clock, and Cleveland to send the Broncos into overtime, where they would go on to win a berth in Super Bowl 21. It was a clutch performance that thrust Elway into the ranks of those special few who have dared destiny and won. For these magic men, challenges were made to be conquered. And the obstacles each overcame on their paths to glory will live forever in the proud history of the National Football League. Anyone can play when there is no pressure. But only the best play their best in the crunch.